Every religion tries in its own way to explain how we got here and what we're supposed to be doing. But cosmologist Lawrence Krauss says that the story science has to tell offers a much greater picture of the still unfolding history of the universe. Lawrence Krauss is founding director of the Origins Project at the University of Arizona. He's also the author of several books, including his latest, The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far. Why are we here? And we're happy that it brings him back to our studio tonight. Great to see you again. It's always good to be here. Steve. Okay, Lawrence, can we just sort of go through a bit of a sartorial thing here? Uh, <laughs> okay, okay we're, we're accustomed to weird shoes, so we get, you yeah. got the red shoes yeah. happening there. Yeah. We get that. Okay. The hat, though, this is a new thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's it's. Um, I, I've done a bunch of events with a friend of mine, um, uh, Johnny Depp, and he always wears a hat, and I discovered that that you know it's fine. So I thought, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and the pin. The pin is the. Flying Spaghetti Monster. It's a uh, religion created by a five-year-old. Um, it's called Pastafarians. And, and it's, it's now an official religion in several places. So that means you can actually have your driver's license picture taken with a spaghetti colander on your head. And it seems to me, it's just, uh, if you're going to have a religion, why not one with a spaghetti you, colander? You are constantly a troublemaker. Anyway. I try. We shall move right mm -hmm. along here. I distinctly recall a little over 50 years ago there was a movie called The Greatest Story Ever Told with Max von Sydow. And you remember and, that. <laughs> yeah, well, I have seen it, and I thought The Greatest Story Ever Told was the Bible, and yet uh, I, you deign to disagree in this book well, yeah, here. The, yeah, the, absolutely. That Greatest Story was, was, in fact, hasn't changed at all in the 2,000 years since it was written. It wasn't even that impressive then, and certainly not that impressive now. It was, it was sort of the goat herder's guide to the universe at the time, it, as, as people who didn't even knew, know the Earth orbited the sun. And so it was the best view at the time of how things came to be, but we've learned a lot since then. And the best part about the new Greatest Story Ever Told so far is it changes. It changes every day. It's better this year than it was last year, and it'll be better next year than this year, because we keep making discoveries. And, and it's not a human invention. It's the, it, the, the imagination of nature is much better than that of humanity. Well, and that is, I presume that's why you say the greatest story ever told so, so far. So far. That's the, yeah, for me, because that's the joy of doing science, is, that, is it changes, and it's surprising. And, and the fact that we go in directions we never thought we'd go is part of the reasons I, I seriously, to be less facetious, think it's, a, it's one of the greatest stories, because Humanity is, and science has been dragged kicking and screaming to places we never expected to go. And I love that. I love the fact that we can change our minds. Even though, and this is a secret, scientists are humans. And that oh. means, yeah, really, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, gonna, yeah, yeah, you got to write I'm going to write that flash. down. Yeah. Newsflash. It's so, just in. Yeah, because, you know, in the story, if you read, the, you read that individual scientists were sort of pig-headed and, and have prejudices and all the rest, but the process of science overcomes that and takes people in the right direction. And that's one of the, if I had to think of a sort of a moral of, of, of the story in some sense, it's that. It's, the, it's that the scientific process can overcome the illusions of reality. And it's, a, it's useful not just in the most esoteric aspects of science, but actually in the modern world today, in politics and everything else. The same techniques of skepticism, empirical evidence, testing, we need that in the real world. I, I, we are going to get to the political yeah, angle, yeah, trust yeah, me, yeah. later on. But I guess, I guess, you know, for a lot of us, I guess, today. Yeah. Einstein is where science began. But as you point out in the book, you know, Einstein couldn't be who he was without the guy who came before well, him. Yeah, without Maxwell and Faraday, Einstein yeah. would have been Einstein, but we would never would know the name. And, yeah. and it's, it's a wonderful story of building on, of, of, of sta as Newton said, standing on the shoulders of giants, although he was actually making fun because uh, one of his competitors was a dwarf. But <laughs> he was not a very nice guy, Newton, as I talked about. Another mischievous guy. Like yeah, you. absolutely. Yeah, he was, he was crazy. But, uh, yeah, it's this, it's a story, you know, we tend to think of individuals, but it's a story that many people contributed to. And, you know, one of the other interesting aspects is that, of course, everyone knows about Einstein and, the, and, and thinks of the revolutions of the beginning of the 20th century, Einstein, quantum mechanics, all of that, as, the, as a sort of the golden era, the golden age of physics mm -hmm. in the 20th century. But one of the things I wanted to talk about in this book is actually, I think historians of the future, there'll be another period between sort of 1955 and 1975 where actually our pictures of the universe changed in a more revolutionary way than I think the, the, 19, the 19, mm -hmm. early 1900s. It was probably the most revolutionary period in the, in the 20th century and maybe in the history of physics, but it's not known about it. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book. When that period began, we understood one force of nature, electromagnetism. By the time it was over, we understood three of the four forces in nature as fully quantum mechanical theories. We had, we had uh, every experiment you could perform was understood. Fundamental symmetries of nature were understood, and we were building the most complicated machine humans have ever built to test these ideas. It's an amazing, 
I mean, it, and that machine was? The Large Hadron Collider, which I, in the book, call mm -hmm. the, like the Gothic Cathedral of the 21st century because mm -hmm. it, the, Goth, the Gothic cathedrals took centuries by thousands of artisans. Large Hadron Collider, 10,000 physicists to build it and from over 100 countries, 20 years. And there's a whole chapter in the book about the Large Hadron Collider because you can't have enough hyperbole. Every, every second at the Large Hadron Collider, more information is generated than in all the world's libraries, every second. Hmm. And that has to be accommodated. And then this 26 kilometer long tunnel has to be evacuated with a vacuum that's sparser than that around the International Space Station. I mean, it's just amazing that humans built that. And the only reason it wasn't to make a better car or toaster was to figure out how we got here. It's amazing that we're willing to do that. I, that you've taken me exactly where I wanted to go next because the good? question everybody asks is, <laughs> is why are we here? And I, and I was fascinated by the distinction you like to make between Never mind the why are we here, how are we here? Well, I think essentially all why questions are how questions. Because if, if you make a, if you say why, you presume purpose, but how do you know there's purpose? Mm -hmm. So when we say why, we almost always mean how, and because that tells us what we really need to know. And the how are we here is an amazing series of cosmic accidents. So the real, so if you want to ask the why question, there's no, there's no reason we're here. It's just mm -hmm. an accident, and that's for some people that's terrifying and upsetting. For me, it's kind of enlivening the fact that that, that all of that the, some field in the early universe froze in a certain way that allowed the universe to be here and to make to make it seem like it's designed for us, but in fact, it's just this accident. And 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 that's that's okay. Okay. Well, no, because I mean, first of all, yeah. you, I mean, you know, there are billions of people yeah. who follow religion who yeah. disagree yeah. with you. Yeah. Uh, but that, and but the other thing you say though in the book very early on is that you think we are probably hardwired to have some kind of religious belief. For yeah. why we're here. Sure, we, I think we're hardwired to have what, they, what the philosophers call teleology. Then we 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 want purpose to, uh, uh, for everything, and and the reason is quite simple in some ways. If it, so, our early ancestors on the African savanna could um, their leaves could be rustling in a tree, and they could just say, "Oh, that's nothing," or they could say, "Maybe there's a maybe there's a, a, a lion behind that tree." And the ancestors of ours that said it was nothing never got to reproduce, so they weren't <laughs> ancestors of ours. So no. we we look for purpose and. It's it's sort of for many people the idea that that there is no there might be no cosmic purpose to our existence somehow makes their lives seem less significant. But to me, uh, the fact that a whole series of accidents conspired to produce this illusion of reality, the particles that make you and I up have mass, but that's an illusion. That's only there because there's this invisible field everywhere in the universe, which sounds like religion, by the way, <laughs> but it's not because in physics, if you postulate an invisible field, you have to find it. And that's what we did with the Large Hadron Collider. We discovered. I'm going to get to that. And, yeah, and the but, Higgs but, and all that. But so, the, but you know, these things were serious acts. And so, for many people, that that is disturbing. But it seems, wow, isn't it amazing that we're here, and that we could enjoy this remarkable accident to have this conversation, and and to and that we can understand the universe back to the earliest moments of the Big Bang. And it's just we should celebrate that, and and not be terrified by the fact that the universe may not be the universe we want. That's the other really mm. important aspect of this, is the universe is the way it is, whether we like it or not. Mm. The other thing I found fascinating was the notion that, that reality, reality is different for you and me right this second. As we look at that camera right there, mm -hmm. we are not experiencing it the same way, even though we are sharing this mm -hmm. space and are the same distance away from it, it. Absolutely, and it was Einstein who really, really demonstrated that specifically that that reality is an, is is unique to each individual that and reality is what you measure what you see length time and that's unique to our circumstances and that that when we try and understand what things are like uh, we it's it's really overcomes this myopia which is really what science is all about i once wrote that that science one of the purposes of science is to make us less comfortable <laughs> and and i thought oh gee that's a bad thing to say but it is because and that, but that's also one of the purposes of learning, of education. Because if you're always comfortable, you, you're never, you know, you know, you're never learning. And one of the reasons to go to school and to and and to experience things in life is to discover the world isn't just like you always thought it was when you were at home. To discover it's it's grander, and that maybe some of the things you thought were natural or not, and 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 to expand your mind. And that's the what the wonder of being human is to is to suddenly understand that our place in the cosmos and our individual notions of, of reality and what's sensible have to confr be confronted all the time. That's why it's the greatest story. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, as promised, follow up on something you okay, talked about earlier, sure. the Large Hadron Collider, and, yeah. and how it was able, as a result of all of what you just yeah. described, 
was able to discover the Higgs. Okay. Let's start there. You need to tell us what the Higgs is. Well, okay, yeah. So the so the 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 amazing thing about the what was postulated in the 1960s ultimately in physics was that there is this invisible field everywhere and that we are living essentially in a cosmic superconductor. In a superconductor like the ones you make in laboratories, if you lived in one, the world would be, seem very different. The world is very different for us in this cosmic superconductor, but because of that field, certain part of, it's like swimming in molasses. If you're swimming in a swimming pool, you swim very fast, but if you're swimming in molasses, which most people would want to do, you'd be swimming very slowly, you'd feel more, more heavy, the resistance would be greater. Mm -hmm. Because that field is there, certain particles, like the particles that make up our bodies and, and the particles that convey one of the forces in nature, interact with that field and experience a resistance. At a fundamental level, they're completely massless and would travel at the speed of light. Because that field is there, they experience a resistance and they act like they're massive. So all of the mass of all the particles in the studio and the galaxies and everything we see in the universe really is an accident to the fact that this Higgs field is there. But in physics, if there's a field in the quantum universe, every field is associated with a particle. So how can you find this field? I like to say it's is cosmic sadomasochism. You spank the vacuum. You dump energy in a single point, so much energy that if that field is there, you'll kick out real particles. So we designed a machine which would basically accelerate particles, in this case protons, at almost the speed of light, 99.999998% the speed of light in one direction. The other direction in Geneva, they go around thousands of times every second. They collide, dump so much energy that we thought we could if the, Higgs particle, if the Higgs field was there, we should be able to kick particles out of literally empty space and see them. And on July 4th, 2012, the Large Hadron Collider uh, reported 50 events that sort of walked like Higgses and quacked like Higgses, and th we thought they were probably Higgses. And, and in the uh, last five years, all of the data tells us that those particles have exactly the properties of the, of the Higgs field, of the Higgs particle that's associated with the Higgs field. So now we understand that there really is this invisible field in nature, and it is responsible for virtually why the world looks the way it does. Uh, the example I, I use in the book, which to me is very poignant, I think, is, and it is particularly appropriate in Toronto where you experience this. I talked about this once in Phoenix, and people didn't know what they were. Ice crystals on a window. Uh, <laughs> if you look at the beautiful pattern of ice crystals on a window, if you lived on one of those ice crystals, one direction would seem very special, and physicists would, would derive laws that would explain why the, along the spine of the crystal forces were different. Theologians would explain why, the, would, would claim that one that direction was divined by God. There'd be wars fought over there whether that direction was the important direction or that direction. Hmm. All of that would seem significant, but when you can see that they're in all directions, you see it doesn't have any significance. This field froze, the Higgs field in our universe, froze in a certain way in the early universe, creating the universe that allows us to exist. But there's nothing, there's nothing any more special about the way it froze in the early universe than the way those ice crystals froze. It's a remarkable accident. If it had froze differently, we wouldn't be here. Or maybe, maybe the laws would be different so that some other kind of life form would arise. But, uh, but our existence is contingent on that remarkable accident, which is, which is an accident. It doesn't mean the laws of physics didn't allow it to happen any more than the crystal on the window happened. Because, but, but that direction doesn't have significance. And, that's our, I mean, the fact that we've been able to discover that, we're, we're, that there's this invisible field everywhere in nature, the fact that first that we'd posit it, that we'd make that extraordinary claim, but then as Carl Sagan would have said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The fact that we'd put together those resources from humanity, bringing the best minds, the best machines, building the technologies that would later on affect our civilization, like at the, at the, in Geneva, where the Large Hadron Collider is, is the place that the World Wide Web was developed which has changed our lives a, a lot. Mm -hmm. So every time you, you develop these new technologies that are exciting, there are always amazing side benefits. But the real purpose is that we devote all this energy just to ask that fundamental question is to me, humanity at, at its best, and now in the news we're seeing so many examples of humanity at its worst, that it's wonderful to see how science brings people together. All those people from different cultures, different religions, different languages, the thousands of physicists working at the Large Hadron Collider, we're working for a common purpose, because science unites. I would argue that religion divides, but science unites. As you make a top 10 list of the most important discoveries in this greatest story ever told so far, where's that on the list? Well, you know, I tend to try not to do things hierarchically, but I think, I think the discovery of the Higgs, uh, in, terms of, in terms of the boldness of, of, of the proposal and the and the challenge that it presented is probably the top discovery. I really the do. The top discovery. Yeah, yeah. Huh. I really, I think it's, it's, 
it really because it created a it, it pushed science forward and validated something by the way I ne I didn't believe it you know I knew the picture and I knew it was being built and I was sure it was wrong I prepared three papers in my in my desk for when it wasn't discovered because it seems so slippery that nature would have this invisible field everywhere I just I just didn't didn't see how it could happen and I was wrong and I think that's mm -hmm. That's, we, I think we said it on this program before, for me, that's the great part of science, is, is willingness to be wrong. And if you're a theoretical physicist, the two great, greatest states to be in are wrong or confused, and I'm in, in the midst of them all the time. <laughs> Let's do a quote from the book here. Okay. You write, each time we peel back one layer of reality, other layers beckon. So each important new development in science generally leaves us with more questions than answers. But it also usually leaves us with at least the outline of a roadmap to help us begin to seek answers to those questions. In which case, given the discovery of the Higgs, what does that suggest that scientists ought to be looking for next? That's a really good question. And we're at a, we're at a terrifying point in that sense, because if we discover the Higgs and nothing else of the Large Hadron Collider, we will be without a roadmap, in a sense. We, the Higgs field, it's great that we discovered it and, it, and it explains a lot about nature. But the next question clearly is, why did this field freeze in the early history of the universe? Why does it have the properties that it does so that it, it condensed and created the, 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 the world we see? Why did it produce the forces of nature that we measure having the strength they have? All those questions are essential, and those are the questions the Large Hadron Collider was actually also designed to build. One of the, one of, there's a theory called supersymmetry that we, we think may address why, some of those why questions, and that idea predicts a whole slew of new fundamental particles would be discovered at the Large Hadron Collider. And many of us, and I'd say most physicists, thought when the Large Hadron Collider turned on, the first thing that would be seen would be all these new particles. It was a lot harder to find the Higgs. So, but if we find the Higgs and don't see anything else, then we don't really know what, which direction to go. And that the, the Large Hadron Collider is going to operate for another 15 or 20 years at a higher energy and higher luminosity. So there's still lots of room for discovery. But if we don't see anything other than the Higgs, it's kind of a nightmare scenario because it means we're going to have to build a much bigger accelerator to find things. And, and the problem is if we don't see anything sociologically, you know, you go to governments and say, guess what? We didn't see anything. Build us a bigger machine. Mm. And it'll probably happen one way or another, but, but, but it would be wonderful to have a signature that told us which is the right direction. Now, with some Canadian content, uh, one of, those, one of the neat things from supersymmetry, if it's there, is that there'll be maybe new particles we'll discover at the Large Hadron Collider. One of those particles we think is likely the dark matter that dominates all the mass in the universe that we've talked about in previous programs. Another way to find those particles is to look for the dark matter that was created at the beginning of time. If the dark matter is elementary particles, it's not just out here, it's going right through you and me. And at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory underground. I'm so glad you mentioned yeah, that. Because I was going to if you yeah, didn't. Yeah, <laughs> and underground there we have dark. We're building these detectors to detect dark matter. So there's a race in some sense between the Large Hadron Collider and these underground detectors. The the discovery of of the, these new particles may happen here in Canada or somewhere mm. else underground by looking by using the cosmic accelerator. Like I tend to think of the universe as a big particle physics experiment that was done once and now it's, it's data analysis. Because in the early period of the universe, the energies were intense, much greater than the Large Hadron Collider. And so those particles could have been created there instead of as they may be today, and we're looking for them now. I must confess that mm -hmm. knowing what a fan of religion you are oh, not, I, oh, okay. I was a little surprised when I got to chapter 22 and I saw you quoting Proverbs uh -huh. at the beginning of the chapter. And the quote that you have plucked from Proverbs says this, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Who might that be a reference to? <laughs> well, I think, I, I think the point is that uh, the great thing about science is that opinions don't really matter, ultimately. And, um, I, and in fact, you will notice that every chapter has a, has a, has a, begins with a verse from the Bible. But you look, first of all, the Bible's literature, so you can find great, great quotes in it, so I have no problens with that. In fact, the, the, the sections of the book are happening as, as offended at least one reviewer, are Genesis, Exodus, and Revelations. <laughs> yes. But I thought if, you know, if we're talking, if we're comparing the real story versus the, the imaginary story, we might as well okay, compare Okay, but them. don't dodge me here. Yeah, who, yeah. who are you referring to when you say a fool takes no pleasure in understanding but only in expressing his opinion? Oh, well, okay, in that case, it's obvious in the modern world there's a president of the United States who's certainly such a fool. And um, how's he doing? Oh, come on, it's, it gets worse every day. It's really, it's really tragic. It's really a tragedy for humanity, but it's, it's a tragedy for the United States to have someone who 
has no interest in um, and no knowledge. And you know, not knowing is okay, but if, as long as you don't know, you don't know. It's it's when you assume you know everything and and don't and and don't express an interest in learning. I was uh, there was an interesting article in the New York Times a few weeks ago that 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 said. It's, we shouldn't be comparing Donald Trump to a four-year-old because it's unfair to four-year-olds. And that wasn't just a joke. But if you think of four-year-olds, they're curious. They want to find out about the world around them. They, they love playing. They love experiment. Here's a man who doesn't read, who doesn't really listen, and, um, and is willing to say anything or do anything uh, for self-aggrandizing. And, and it's really... Um, yeah, and the, you know, the recent thing with the removing from the Paris Accords is, ju is just a tragedy, which the world will overcome one way or another but it it's it for the for the United States you know as you know I grew up in Canada so I'm aware of the Canadian American relationship but the United States has been the global leader in in the world in many ways and what what we're seeing now is 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 this individual taking the United States out of the leadership role not just in the Paris climate accords but in 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 spending money on research with if you look at compared to China uh, uh, it, th there's lots of, and for the first time in my in my experience as a scientist, we're seeing people move to China to to, to work in research labs out of the United States, and even getting out of their Trans-Pacific Partnership. He's basically taking the United States away from that global leadership role in every way and ceding it to other countries. Well, that's you know, as far as the world goes, that's okay, but it, but for the, the United States, it's a tragedy because that that willingness to be at the front edge, especially in research. Uh, this last year, if you look at the budget, not only is there a cut by almost 20% in every major area of non-defense research and development, but the other things that make being human worth being human are being cut. The National Endowment for the Arts was proposed to be cut to zero. National Endowment for the Humanities, zero. Corporation for Public Broadcasting, zero. Well, Congress won't allow any of this. One hopes so, but the, it, you know, it would be okay, except Congress, the American Congress right now, which is also controlled by the same party, seems willing to do anything as long uh, as long as they can remain in power and I'm I, I agree with you that I don't think the eventual cuts will be as draconian as those that have been proposed but there's a, a quote which I don't know if I give in the book but it's a wonderful quote from the first director of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory who was asked in the 1960s whether that accelerator would aid in the defense of the nation and he said no but it'll help keep the nation worth defending hmm. and it's science art music, literature, those are the things that'll make America great, if you want, and make Canada great in every country. Those are the things that matter, not the walls we build or the arms we sell. And, and I think it's really important that the public needs to be able to appreciate this, and both here in this country and the United States, require their politicians to base their policies on empirical evidence, to support the, the, the things that nurture our culture, that nurture the humanity that, that makes all of us want to live and, and and that's the really important thing. Let me ask a follow-up on that because as a guy who clearly is driven by facts mm -hmm. and what is empirically provable I'd like to know your view when you hear somebody say and the president has said it uh, you know don't don't bother me with the facts here's what I think. Yeah I mean th that's that is the problem of uh, this this that we're growing up in a world of alternative facts is a huge problem and I think part, and it comes back to science again in a way we we teach science as if it's a bunch of facts but it's not a bunch of facts. It's a process for deriving facts. It's a process for telling the sense from nonsense. And in schools, when I was growing up, you know, you, you just sort of, schools were places that would just fill you with information. But I, I have more information in my, in my cell phone here, but I have more misinformation. Mm. The way we have to educate children in the 21st century is not piling on facts, is, is getting to ask questions, getting them to learn the process by which they, when they go to the internet, they can, they can, tell whether something is sensible or not by being skeptical, by asking, what's the evidence? Let me look for another source. If we don't learn those tools as a population, then I'm, I fear for the future democracy. But because how do you communicate that message to people who are, for whatever reason, skeptical of what comes out of the mouths of so-called experts these days? Well, look, I think ultimately, you can't tell people what to believe. I mean, I can talk and pontificate all I want, but I think the way we need to do it is discover these things for ourselves. So I think what we need to do is ask questions, actually ask each other questions. Um, and, and, and in fact, in schools, build teaching around questioning rather than answering. Well, ask questions and then let's how to discover this together. Parents and politicians alike, but particularly parents and teachers, have to be willing to say, you know, when asked a question, I don't know. 
I mean, as a parent, you know, you really want to give your kid the answer. And as a teacher, I'm sure you do too. But it's so much better to say, hey, I don't know. Let's discover this together. You because won't hear that in politics either. Yeah, no, no but exactly. But if we could turn it into a positive, because not only are we hardwired, as we said earlier, to look for, for reasons for things, but we're hardwired to want to solve puzzles. And if we make the process of learning discovery and the process of, of even politics, it's hard to believe, but, but politics should be a process of discovering how to proceed. And the public, I think an informed public can choose legislators who are at least interested in that. The problem is the American public wasn't informed. And it's really fear, I think, ultimately. For many people, fear science because they think it's going to undermine their faith, perhaps, or maybe it's bringing a brave new world that scares them. The world is the, world is the way it is, and things are going to happen, and we have to open our eyes. And I, you know, I began this book with a quote from Virgil, uh, which is a very famous quote, but I end it with, a, with a, a, the next line from the Aeneid, which is, release your fear. And I think that's the most important thing. If we, instead of, our, of being afraid of reality, if we embrace it, then, then we'll move forward. And, and, and fear is, is the biggest problem, I think, in, in our democracies right now. People are using immigration, terrorism, to, to get people to do what they want. And, and it, I, think, I can't, can't remember if it was Goebbels or Goering who said a long time ago, whether you have a democracy or a dictatorship, it doesn't matter. You want people to do what you want, make them afraid. Mm. We, we need to stop being afraid to move forward, stopping letting our, our leaders cause us to be afraid of things and, 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 and accept the world for what it is and, and use that to make a better future. Pasteur said that fortune favors the prepared mind. And I think that's really important. FDR said it 80 years ago. We yeah. have nothing to fear, fear but fear itself. Yeah. Let's come full circle and finish up on this. Yeah. And, and that is, I, I, I guess I read in the back of the book that you wrote some of this in Christopher Hitchens' yeah. writing space. Yeah. And I, I wonder, just tell us a bit about how that influenced the finished product. Well, yeah, I was writing the very last part of the book. I was, I was staying, I was in, uh, in California in, in Palo Alto. I was, ostensibly going to attend a meeting, but I was with Christopher's widow and, 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 and staying at the house where they were staying and in his study, and I didn't go to the meeting because it was just, I mean, I would like to say I channeled Christopher, except that you know I don't believe that kind of stuff, <laughs> but, but, it was, but Christopher was an inspiring individual in so many ways, willing to question, willing to provoke, and, all, and of course in ways that I, uh, that I can't match, and I don't know whether anyone can match, was so knowledgeable, so literate, uh, his book house was so full of books, but but every one was read, uh, you know, and 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 that's an inspiration. So when I was thinking about about trying to end the w book on a grand note, the fact that I was in Christopher's study was not lost on me, and the fact that Christopher, of course, was another critic of religion, myths, and superstition, and even in the political arena, arena was a, a critic of any of 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 the of the the norm, if, it, if the norm was, was false. He was willing to call out people as liars or call out institutions as bad. I mean, there, he did things that would be literally have gotten his head cut off in, in the ancient world. He, as you may know, he, he was the devil's advocate for, against Mother Teresa being made a saint. <laughs> and I think if you're willing to be the devil's advocate, um, that shows great strength of character. You speak of grand notes, and I, I don't know if you remember, but the last time you were here, we sort of went out on a grand note. Yes, I and remember that. And in case that. you've forgotten, mm -hmm. let, let's just remind everybody how we ended our last interview. Go ahead, let's roll this. Live long and prosper. To you too. Sheldon, beam us up. Well, I'm sorry to say our transporter beam is not working today. It's hard today. to beat that. I don't know if we forgot to pay our hydro bill or what, but the transporter isn't working, so can I just simply say, we're so grateful that you always spare some time for us when you come back to Canada. And thanks for visiting us here at TVO. Thanks. It's so wonderful to be able to have an intelligent conversation with you. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.